Hello, my name is Kevin Squire, and today I'll be doing a deep dive into creating shared libraries with PackageCompiler.jl. This is work done in collaboration with Nikhil Mitra, Christopher Carlson, and Simon Byrne. Here's an overview of what I'll be talking about. First, I'll give some motivation, why we did this and why you might or might not want to. I'll be going over the anatomy of a Julia installation, including how Package Compiler recreates this installation. We'll go over the process of creating a shared library using Package Compiler, and I'll give an example both in C and in Rust. And finally, I'll offer some conclusions. So why did we do this? At my company, we have a real-time code base written in Rust and an optimization algorithm written in Python that we wanted to include in, in this real-time code base. Now, writing high-performance Python is challenging, and porting that same code to Rust also turned out to be challenging. However, porting it to Julia was trivial. And so instead of spending time porting the Python to Rust, we spent time figuring out a simple and easy way to call Julia from Rust. And that's what I'll be talking about today. Now, there are all different alternatives for calling into Julia from other languages. People have been embedding Julia in other languages almost as long as Julia has been around. There's a full chapter in the Julia manual on how to embed Julia. There's also many language-specific bindings, including one for Rust called JLRS. Now, both the Embedding Julia chapter in the Julia manual and JLRS use similar paradigms, and we found them to be somewhat cumbersome and challenging to use for our purposes. First of all, they require that Julia and all the packages you require be installed in the system that you're running on. Second, the actual act of calling out to those libraries was was somewhat cumbersome. We were looking for a simpler solution. StatiCompiler.jl is another alternative that we had high hopes for. StatiCompiler.jl is another approach which uses the LLVM infrastructure to produce machine code directly from Julia code without the need for a Julia runtime. It hasn't seen much activity recently, but I'm hopeful that an approach like this will eventually be available. In the meantime, we have package compiler. So typically, you, would want, you might want to use this approach if you have an existing C, C++, Rust, or similar code base written in a language that you can call out to C libraries from. You might have the need for some specific scientific numerical or other functionality that's easier to write in Julia than in your target language. And while it's not necessary, having that code run in a Docker image really eases integration. There are some limitations to our approach. Because we are creating a C library, we're limited to C compatible types in the exposed interface. We can only initialize and call Julia from a single thread in the source language, although multiple threads within Julia are fine. And there's no support yet for installing multiple Julia-based C libraries. And as a workaround, you would have to create a Julia package which pulls in all the other dependencies, which you could then embed in your code base. So why might you not want to create a library with PackageCompiler.jl? If Julia is the primary language of your code base, you probably don't need this. If any of the limitations on the previous slide are showstoppers, then using Package Compiler is probably not going to work for you. And finally, if you need a lightweight library, then this is probably not your solution, as it pulls in the full Julia runtime, and that is not, not exactly light. So, Let's talk a little bit about, about Package Compiler. Package Compiler, up until now, has been useful for a couple of main purposes. One is creating custom system images, or sys images. This precompiles common code and libraries so that you do not have to pay for the compilation cost the first time you call it. Using the same technology, Package Compiler can create relocatable application bundles. These are just the Julia code plus any artifacts, that is shared libraries that, is, that are required by packages that you're using, where the REPL entry point has been replaced by code that calls into your main function, and which are built and bundled in a way that is relocatable. So let's look at the anatomy of a Julia installation. When you install Julia, the main part of the installation contains a bin directory with a Julia executable. That's what brings up the REPL when you run it. There's also a library directory, or lib directory, which contains the main Julia libraries, 
the main system image and an, all of the, so the supporting libraries required by the runtime. It also contains a shared directory with both base and standard libraries. Additionally, each user will have a .julia directory, which contains additional artifacts, uh, development files, and other files that are useful for the installation. The artifacts library in particular contains additional shared libraries that are required by packages you're using. So when we create an application bundle with packagecompiler.jl, it looks quite similar. There's a bin directory where instead of the Julia runtime, there's a binary executable called, in this case, my app, which is a thin wrapper around Julia code that a user has bundled into a custom Julia sysimage. The library directory looks very much the same with the notable exception of the missing standard system image because, well, that's with the executable up here. And then there's, an, in addition, there's an artifacts directory which contains all additional libraries that are needed by packages you're using. So if instead we're creating a library bundle, it also looks quite similar. In this case, in, there's no bin directory. The lib directory looks very similar. And then if we're creating a shared library, that also goes into the, li the lib directory. In addition, there are, there's an include directory, which, which typically contains two include files. One is julia init.h, and the other one will be the init file that corresponds to the functions you're exporting in your shared library. And finally, the artifacts are tucked under a shared julia library, which again, contain shared libraries that you might need. So what exactly is libmylib.so? It's a julia system image. And, as you can tell from the extension here, it's also a C library. So, one I, the main idea here is to place custom Julia code in the system image and expose a C interface to this code. And the package compiler already does most of this. Let's go through an example. Here we're going to create a conjugate gradient C library. This library will export the conjugate gradient method from iterative solvers.jl. And we're going to try calling this, this function from C or Rust. So the main program in C would look something like this. First, we're going to initialize Julia. We'll do some initialization of some local variables. And then we'll call the conjugate gradient in Julia. This is going to work in place and then return whether or not it was successful. We'll check the result and then shut down Julia. On the Julia side, this is what the code will look like. The CG function itself that we're trying to export is already part of iterative solvers. And so we don't need to write anything there, but we do need to expose an interface to it. In this case, that interface is Julia CG. Now this is the interface that is supposed to be exported from the shared library. And the way that we export this function is by annotating it with a C callable macro. You also notice that all of the types in both in the signature um, as well as the return type are C compatible types. This function simply wraps the inputs in, in a way that Julia understands them and calls the conjugate gradient method and then returns one or zero as it works in place and modifies these variables when it's, as it's uh, running. So we've gone over what cg.jl would look like. We also need a separate mini project to actually build the library. And that would look something like this. It'll have these three files in it. Let's take a look at build.jl. Build.jl is a very simple file. Its main purpose is to call the create library function in packagecompiler.jl to which you pass the location of the package that you're trying to wrap, the location of the target, and the name of the library you're trying to create. Lib will be prepended to this name. And we also pass in any header files that, we're, that we created. After we run that code, what's generated is something that looks very similar to what we saw before. We have an include directory, which has the Julia in it and then the header file that we passed in on the previous file. 
and it has a lib directory with our custom Julia system image in it, which also, as we noted, is a C shared library. And then we have some artifacts shown right here. This is what it looks like in Linux. And this is what it looks like under a Mac OS where the extension has changed. Windows is a little bit different. Instead of a lib directory, there's a bin directory. And the main reason is that Windows does not use the same directory structure as uh, Mac OS and, and Linux do. And so to actually compile this on Windows, the typical solution is to drop all these files in the same directory as the executable file that you're trying to call them from. Okay. I mentioned Julia init.h a couple of times, and we already saw that we need to both call initialize Julia and shut down Julia from the C program that we wrote. Julia init.h just contains signatures for those functions. And then the actual functions that those refer to are compiled by package compiler and included and exported from the shared library that we're creating. And they do exactly what it seems they would do. Init Julia sets up uh, arguments and does other things that are required to initialize the Julia runtime. And shut down Julia shuts down the Julia runtime. So if we call mylib from C, uh, we've already seen the C library. I'll show it to you again briefly. Uh, again, we're go it's going to initialize Julia, call into Julia CG, and then finally get a result, check it, and print out success if, it's, if it uh, succeeded, and then finally call shutdown. So we'll go to a quick demo here. So here we are in the directory with the main function that I showed you earlier, along with the make file. The shared library has already been compiled, and we've set up the make file in such a way that they can find the shared library. If we run make, We can see that it compiles everything, and at the very end, it links in libcg. So now we have a, a binary called main-c, and if we run that, we should hopefully get success, which is all we expect from this library. All right. So one important component of this is that it's it's important to be able to find your library both at compile time and runtime. To do so at compile time, we need to add the include, make sure that we can find the include files. That's added to C flags with the dash I flag, as well as linker files. So we need to add the location of the library directory, as well as link in Julia and your custom sys image or your shared library. At runtime is another, is another story altogether. There are three ways that we can find your library at runtime. One thing we can do is we can install the library globally. This is especially useful if, you, if your code is running in a Docker image. Another option is to set the runtime path or our path. Now, this is possible on Linux or on Mac OS. And the incantation on Linux looks something like this. And on Mac, it looks, uh, it, they change the, uh, they change how the, how you refer to the executable, but it looks something like this. And what this says is that when looking for shared libraries, if you can start at the, uh, the path of the executable, go up one directory and then look in the lib directory. And then we also need to tell it where to find additional libraries in the Julia subdirectory. Okay. But the third option, if you can't install or can't or do not, do not want to install your library globally and you may, and if you might not know the relative location, the relative location of your of the library compared to your executable, well, then you probably need to set an environment variable so that the linker can find your library at runtime. What library variable you set depends on what operating system you're on. On Linux or other Unices, you'll set LD library path. On Mac, you'll set DYLD fallback library path and on Windows, you'll just set path. And then if we look at the make file that uh, we just used to compile main-c, uh, this, is, this is what's done here. On Darwin, on, uh, that's Mac OS, we set the executable path this way, or on Linux, we do it like this. Okay, so that's how we call, link to, and find the library, uh, the shared library that we created 
from C. Uh, I'm going to go over the same thing from Rust. And really the process is pretty much the same at the high level and the only difference is in well, how you can actually configure it. So let's look at the Rust library first. Uh, this, is, this Rust program is really just a Rust version of the C program we saw earlier. The main function is doing the same things. It's calling init Julia. It's calling out to the conjugate gradient method that we defined, that we, the wrapper that we defined. And then at the end, it's checking the return value and at the end it is shutting down Julia. Okay, there's a few additional features here. One is that Rust does not use header files and we still need, and we do need to tell it the function signatures of the functions that we defined. And so we need to give it uh, the function signature for init Julia, shut down Julia, and the Julia CG function. Okay. The um, other thing we have here is the Laplace function, which I did not actually show you in the, in the main, but this is a callback that exists that is called from the uh, Julia function. The C program had a C version of this, and this is the uh, Rust version, which can also be called back as a C function from Julia. And let's go over what we would do from Rust. We're now in the Rust directory. This has a few more files in it. Uh, we'll go over some of those in, in a moment, but in particular, we can see that the source directory contains the main RS file that I just went over. If we build that file, runs cargo build, it finishes, and the output is placed in a target folder here. I check in. And, and we can see that it ran, it printed out the norm, which was very small, and we got success. So as before, we have to be able to find our library at compile time. Now, the idea is still the same. The actual particulars for how you do this in Rust are a little bit different. So in particular, when you are setting a when you're passing in information to link in dynamic libraries, the idea is the same, but it works a little differently. Usually you create a build.rs file where you pass the path to the library, the names of the, and as well as the names of the libraries that you're uh, looking to, to link. And at runtime, we have exactly the same uh, story as we had in C. Options one and three are exactly the same. Option two is the same as well, but the particulars are different. So specifically, if you wish to set the R path, you do it in a config.toml file located in that cargo. And this is what that would look like. That's about it. If you notice, there's been a lot of manual setup required for a lot of this. And if that's too much for you, well, we've set up a package template recipe for generating the, the expected Julia structure. At the time of this recording, that's still in merge request. However, it will either become part of package template or be pulled into its own package. And then using it will look something like this, where you go using package templates, you create a library template for the library you wish to create, and then you instantiate it. And when you do, you get a directory structure which looks similar to the ones I've already shown you, but is a little bit more complete. Uh, in particular, it adds stubs for test, adds a license file, a readme, and in, for the build directory, it adds an install script, as well as stubs for generating pre-compile statements. Hopefully you find this useful. So in conclusion, we are using this in production right now. Uh, so for us, it's been stable with uh, no issues. In the future, we'd love to, to see or add support for installing multiple Julia-based C libraries. And for our purposes, actually better multi-threaded support for the target language would be very useful. But that's all. These slides, as well as all of the code mentioned here, can be found under uh, this, uh, the link right here. And libcg itself is also, can also be found in a separate repository by Simon Byrne here. Hope you enjoyed the talk.